were speaking with Gertrude Siplington Hargraves. She was born in Canton in 1908 and has lived in Canton most of her life until moving to Livonia. We're here in her home. Um, she's chatting with us about her family. Uh, she's done a lot of genealogical studies of, of her family. She's related to several of the Canton families. Uh, let's start with your grandfather, Sitlington. My grandfather, uh, Sitlington, was born in Stonehouse, England. He was the son of uh, Diane and Robert Sitlington. And he came to this country by the way of Canada. Before he came to this country, he had apprenticed as a millwright. And when he got into Canada, he found that there was no jobs available, and so he did his apprentice work as a carpenter in Canada. And then he came by the way of Canada to the United States and uh, to Ypsilanta. And then he married Frances Smith, and they had eight children, and she uh, passed away, and then he married my grandmother, Frances Elizabeth Lilly, and they had uh, seven children, making a total of 15. And my grandmother, Sitlington, was able to uh, weld all of these children into one big family. Uh, her stepchildren called her mother and was very uh, happy with her and they visited her real often and uh, the one daughter, younger ones, said when my grandmother died somebody said to her, well you're only a stepdaughter and she said well, this is my mother, and I, I think that's a remark that speaks very well of my grandmother, Zitlington. Uh, the farm he took, uh, part of it was a land grant of 40 acres, and the other part was 40 acres from the Smith family. This is the house my grandfather built, and it is also the house where I was born. In the days before people went to the uh, hospital. Yes, oh yes, it was all at home. Yes. Probably had a midwife mm -hmm. and a doctor. I'm sure there was a doctor. Every Sunday there was a family gathering. Everybody came to visit. Uh, mother, grandmother, or Aunt Lizzie, or s had some other reason for coming. Uh, we, uh, as little children, it was a time when everybody bought a little gift for the little children. Oh, that's the way I got my teddy bear. And the teddy bear was one that you saved for a long time, correct? I, I saved my teddy bear until it all fell to pieces. My son used my teddy bear. That's the only teddy bear he had. And it was, it had, grandmother had patched it years before. In fact, we left it out and it got wet one night and we took it in and and was bemoaning the fact that Teddy got sopped with water. She said, oh, that's, we'll take care of that. And grandmother rejuvenated Teddy, and then when the uh, feet and the hands would wear off, and Grandma put new patches on them. Mm -hmm. yes. I have my first doll. It was made by my grandmother, Jared, uh, the first Christmas I was in this world. And uh, you can see where I have chewed the legs and the arms. And several years ago, uh, one of the ladies at the church uh, redressed her. And she's precious as far as I'm concerned. She has a china head and a homemade body. Mm -hmm. And she has all the pinnings that any little girl should have. A picture of my father as I remember my father. And... Uh, I was only 18 when he died. I took on a, a, a lot of responsibility because I had to help my mother. And my father had more or less prepared me for this because he had told me all the summer before, we do this because of this and we do that because of that. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle was my right-hand man. My uncle Ed Robson was my 
right hand man when I was didn't know what to do he always come forth with mm -hmm. to help me mm -hmm. and so I grew very close to the Robinson family and uh, that was my mother's sister and husband mm -hmm. my my brother uh, got a brain tumor and uh, they finally decided it was a brain tumor and he went to Grace Hospital in Detroit for surgery, and my mother went to stay with him in the hospital. And uh, uh, I was supposed to stay with my other grandmother, but I had said that I could go home anytime I wanted to because I could walk down with the kids uh, that was going that way. And so the first night, my aunt was right there and picked me up all my clothes and everything, and I went to stay with the Robinson family for probably a month or six weeks. I don't know how long. I got real lonesome. I remember that. And they took me to the hospital to see my mother and my brother. You told me, too, it was very hard for you when you lost your brother. Well, yes, because we lived uh, back from the uh, main highway, and there was no houses anywhere around us and so there was no children to play with. We had been very, very close, uh, the two of us, you know, mm -hmm. and it was uh, hard for me to be there and, and uh, all day and nobody to play with mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want to belittle my uh, father or my mother nor my grandmother, but there was work to do and they couldn't do much to mm -hmm. uh, help. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so when I got a little bigger, uh, I'd stayed over with the Robinson family uh, when my brother was in the hospital, and uh, their son, Robert, was my same age, and, and so I could either walk all the way over there, which was four miles, or I could maybe get a ride with the man from the creamery. A long distance for you to walk as a small child. Four miles. I, yes, but I played along. I uh -huh. I knew every place. Uh, I I knew who lived in every house along the way, and so it wasn't. And I just kind of played along. Mm -hmm. Most of the activities uh, for children then, uh, well, for families, I suppose, centered around um, the church. The church, and, uh, the church, and the school, school was the whole thing around there. Mm -hmm. And then I also could. Uh, when I was seven years old, I could get on the streetcar, they called it then, and I could go to Detroit to my dad's sister's. And she would uh, go to the depot, and I was to stay on the streetcar till I got to the depot, and then I was to go get off and with my luggage and, and go in and look for her. Mm -hmm. She didn't look for me. I was to go in and look for her. and. Uh, that was kind of an experience for a seven, eight-year-old child to take their, and I took my doll, uh -huh. took my doll, and and then I got to do a lot of things in Detroit because they really entertained me. So you took the interurban into Detroit, and then later on you wound up taking the interurban, uh, that was down Michigan Avenue, correct? Yes, I did. took that in the other direction to Ypsilanti to go to high school. Yes. Yes, and to college too. Uh -huh. Tell me a little bit about your school experiences. What was it like to go to a one-room schoolhouse? Oh, I just thought that was the way everybody did. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, the Sheldon School is still there, but I went up for the rededication and it, it isn't much like it was. Mm -hmm. There was an old woodshed there. I hoped that they'd rebuild the woodshed, but they didn't. And the outside Johns, of course. and. And uh, later on, we had inside Johns. But it was fun. There was always several of us walked down Michigan Avenue together. And uh, we weren't supposed to rock the rails for the DUR, but occasionally we did if we didn't get caught. <laughs> you had a maypole at school. Yes, and uh, we wound the maypole. That was on the 1st of May, uh, just uh, so Oh, I think it was or? around the time. School was always out in May. Mm -hmm. oh. And all, I think it was the 
finale of school being out. What did young people do for fun? Well, I guess we had all our fun at school mm -hmm. when I was going to school. And then later on, uh, they had Epworth League at church, mm -hmm. and we'd have fun there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and we had fun at church, we'd have different things at church. But even when I went to high school, I, I got to stay to do some of the things that were in daylight hours, but I didn't do anything that was night very often Mostly. because it meant that uh, uh, somebody had to come out to the streetcar to meet me because they weren't. Mm -hmm. It was a little way to walk back. Uh, the school and church both put on pageants, didn't they, that the children and, were in? Uh, we always had a Christmas program at the church and we always probably had a Christmas program at school. We had many socials at school. Uh, the what we call the old Maccabee Hall, uh, they had programs there in the winter, like Farmers Institute and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the milkmen always had a supper. The creamery put on the brought the ice cream and sent out the oysters and and paid for the milk that they made oyster stew. And the women made pies. And all you got for the supper was oyster stew and pie. But it was good. Mm -hmm. I've seen my dad take the wash bar boiler and put the oysters in it and cook them, and then grab a whole can of milk and put in it, and butter, salt, and pepper. Sounds like a good uh, community act. And we always had ice cream, because uh -huh. they send the ice cream out from the creamery. Now those were some of the things that we did. What about as you got older uh, dances uh, for the teenagers uh, and, and the community people? Well, the the, you know, the Methodists frowned on dancing. Uh -huh. And so uh, it wasn't until I was quite a bit older that I got to go to dances. You told some stories about going to Frank Windsor's general store on Michigan Avenue. Well, that was a stopping off place. If the once in a while, uh, the law was you couldn't go in there because they said the kids were stealing. But as a usual thing, we could stop in there. And some of the kids would steal candy, but I knew better than to steal candy or anything. What do you remember of the uh, inside of the general store? Oh, uh, I remember there was a coffee grinder and there was uh, some kind of a gadget that they pulled down over a whole big round of cheese, and I remember the pot belly stove in there. It must have been pleasant on cold winter days. Yes. After you went to uh, high school and uh, you became, it went on to then the normal school, which is today Eastern Michigan, Michigan. University, uh, you began teaching. Uh, but once you got married, things changed, didn't they, for teachers in the 1930s? Yes, and things changed. They didn't hire married teachers. And so I substituted after my son. I think he was about ready to go to kindergarten. Uh, it was World War I time, and uh, they needed substitute teachers. And, and uh, uh, so I went to substituting. And I substituted in every kind of a classroom you can think of. From home economics to chemistry, I had no preparation for any of them, but they were so in need of substitute teachers mm -hmm. that I would go, and I liked to go because it was money. Mm -hmm. This was during World War II? Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and you did teach for then uh, quite a long time. Uh, I, uh, they lifted the ban, I think it was 1946, and I had my degree in math and science, and uh, I uh, went teaching math in what was the Wayne High School, mm -hmm. and we later uh, moved over to Wayne Memorial, which is a great big school, and then we moved over, to, well, we were told that some of us would have to go to John Glenn 
and some of us would have to stay and we could take our choice. We could ask what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of fun to open Wayne Memorial brand new, so I asked to go to John Glenn. And I finished in John Glenn in 1970. And I, uh, I have more than 30 years of teaching. And what subjects did you teach? I taught mathematics, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. That was what my degree was in. I think one year pre previous to Wayne, I taught uh, world history, but uh, it was mathematics. I taught algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, you name it. Now, while you were teaching at Wayne Memorial? Well, he come to Wayne Memorial, and, uh, and I had him in geometry along with all his pals. Your son? Yes. Yes, that, that must have been uh, very interesting for both him and you. Well, he kind of didn't like it, but there was no choice. Uh -huh. the, that year they were telling kids that they weren't going to need geometry. Uh, they could didn't need to take that. And uh, his mother being a teacher, she insisted that he take geometry. Mm -hmm. And so, but I had all his friends in the same class, so... It, as far as I was concerned, it didn't bother me too much, and it didn't bother him. This is a picture of the Lilly residence at the corner of Michigan Avenue and uh, Lilly Road. And the road was named for this family. Uh, this is my grandmother here at the right, and uh, her brother, Jim, or James, and her sister, Jane. This one was taken at the same place, and it was the Lillian Lee reunion. Now, I don't know uh, when it was taken, but it was taken before I was born. I can identify, I think, all of the people in this picture. And this is a picture of Michigan Avenue before it was paved. That streetcar or the interurban was going down through there and Frank Windsor's store where everybody went for their groceries. What did it cost to ride on the interurban? I think I first went to high school it was 26 cents a day. Uh -huh. But I always had a little change left so that on Friday night I could stop downtown in Ypsilanti and have a tin roof <laughs> with my friend and the Fisher. And this picture is of my grandmother Jarrett's family. Uh, the uh, one here is Aunt Mary. This is my mother, and this is uh, Aunt Annie Robson that I told you about that looked after me. And this is a picture of the uh, Jarrett farm across from the historical society. That house was just recently torn down, but it had been brick sided later, hadn't it? Yes, it had brick siding on to, towards the left. It shows the barn and the house both in the picture. This is Sheldon School, uh, like it was when I went to school. This is one of the pictures of Sheldon School when I uh, went to Sheldon School. Uh, I don't know, uh, I probably was in fourth or fifth grade, maybe not that far. And you are the uh, second from the left in the third row. Yes, I'm the second from the left in the third row. This is what they called a, a barn raising, and it was at the George Smith farm. And these were the men that were going and help doing it. This is William Jarrett that settled on uh, Canton Center Road. William Jarrett came from Ruth's, England, and uh, he came to Detroit and worked for a brewery and drove team, and then he went back to England and married my grandmother. Uh, and then they, he came back to Detroit and he drove team and worked on now what is Greenfield Village. Uh, they were, t it was like a forest, I guess, but they had a house back there because once I went back to see the house, my mother took me back. 
so I could see the house where she was born. Anna Marshall Jarrett. She came from Withermsey, England, and uh, she married my grandfather. Uh, she, when she came to this country, they lived in Durban and they were clearing wood, and she was a cook for the uh, uh, cadre of people that worked. And then, when she moved out in the country, she was a midwife, and she delivered a lot of the babies around uh, Canton Center. This is my father, and it's a team of horses, and he was a farmer, and uh, he did everything with horses. Uh, I, the only thing I can think of to contrast it with, he plowed with a hand plow, and now they have ten bottom plows. This is my father when he was perhaps 18, 21, somewhere along there. These are my mother's certificates of merit from the Canton Center School. One teacher is Mary Ackley, A-C-U-L-L-E-Y. And the other is um, from Anna Wiles. Uh, this is a picture of me and my dog. I, you got my doll and my teddy bear and my dog. And this was a good, faithful dog for a long time. He always met me after I went, started school. What was his name? Fido. Uh, this is the kerosene lamp that came from the farm that you carried up to bed with you when you went to bed. There was no electricity. As long as I lived on the farm, there was no electricity. And this has been kept in the family for years. I'm the custodian now. It was the candle molds that my grandmother Lily used to make candles when she come to this country. And this is the, the bell that my dad's sister used when she taught a country school. I think it was a Hicks school, which is in uh, Nankin Township. Again with uh, Gertrude, uh, who has been kind enough to invite us back, um, and she has some other things that uh, we discovered after our first visit. Uh, what is that pin? This pin is uh, uh, Elizabeth Lilly, my great grandmother, that settled at the uh, corner of Lilly Road and Michigan Avenue. Of course, I never saw her or anything, but I've always heard about her. And I have her, her rocking chair in the basement. Oh. And you said somebody wore that all the time? Was that my, your... my own grandmother wore this all the time. And, and that's how I remembered who it was and what it was, because she told me about it. This picture, my mother said she won for spelling in school. And her teacher was Mrs. Smalley. These two uh, cups. Uh, my father brought from, uh, he went to Toledo, and when he come back, he brought us these cups, and he brought my mother a, a cream pitcher, uh, just like these, but I guess that got broken. I haven't it. Uh, but uh, we drank our water out of it. We were not milk drinkers, either one of us. Uh -huh. This is a pair of skates. I'm not real sure that it was, there were my father's skates. But I know he did skate, and uh, they came from the farm. They're uh, unusual in that there's a pig. Uh -huh. Where's the pig? The pig in the heels. Whether that went up in their shoes or not, I don't know. Uh, but they're not skill blades, they're iron blades. This is a butter mold that my grandmother used when she got her butter all made. She made it pretty by rolling this over the top of the butter and it made a figures in the butter. The other day you took the picture of the candlestick molds and these are the sniffers that they used to fix the candles after they were all sealed and ready to use. And they these I'm sure was used by Elizabeth Lilly. These are still your scales and when my son was born I was not in the hospital, and my mother was there. 
and my mother insisted that he be rolled up in a diaper or a blanket or something and she and the doctor took the pictures of him. Uh, not pictures, I shouldn't say pictures, but they weighed him to see how much he weighed. And we used these in the winter time, Thanksgiving and Christmas, because we raised geese and they always butchered the geese and got them ready for market. And then Dad always uh, weighed them before he went to market. Uh, there was three pieces to this. I don't know where the other iron is, but the, my mother always said that my dad bought them for her when she was first married because Grandma had the old-fashioned irons. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing to it. And you can take this off and put this iron back on the stove and then take this one and iron with it. And when it gets cold, you take this off and you put it back on this iron that was on the stove. This is the crock my, my grandmother and my mother used when they were going to make bread. When they boiled the potatoes at noon for dinner, they put two or three potatoes in here and mashed them. And then they drained the water off the potatoes on it, and it was the start of their bread for the next day. This is a set, a chamber set, what they used to call it. And in your spare bedroom, you had a commode, a uh, piece of furniture, and on the commode set the washbowl and pitcher. And there was a door down below, and, and you put the pot down below so nobody could see it. And you put your best towels and your best washcloth and everything there in the hanging on the commode. And when you had guests, they use this instead of going down and using the old wash tub like we all did. This is a chamber pot. And it, it was, uh, this commode had a place for it where you put it in so nobody could see it. I don't know why it had to be out of sight, but it had to be out of sight. And this was in the days before indoor plumbing. And it was the days before indoor plumbing, as I said. Uh, you couldn't take your guests down in, in the kitchen and close the doors and, and put them in the wash tub. Uh -huh. This is an iron kettle, and uh, they used the iron kettles to try the fat when they butchered from the pigs. And uh, that's the only had made popcorn for us kids. Rather than pop it in the spider like my mother did, uh -huh. he would go and get the iron kettle and take a lid off the stove and uh, uh, put his popcorn in here because he could pop it all at once. And then he turned it like this on the, on the stove. And it was lots of fun to watch him popcorn. My dad did a lot of butchering for people that didn't know exactly how to butcher. And the entrails, uh, my mother went along with him and she skinned the fat off in the entrails so that that was tried with the fat pieces that they cut off the pork. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, did they use the fat for anything after they melted it? What? Did they use the fat for anything? Oh yes, it was lard. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, my mother had crocks. Uh, well, they're about the butter crock size. And she would uh, put this fat in these crocks and they could keep it so that my mother never had to buy lard. This other crock was used for various things that I can, can remember. They had, we had two big, great big crocks. Uh, one where they put the salt pork down to keep it until it could be used. And the other was, uh, they, in the fall they took the cabbage and made sauerkraut. And uh, they were put in the winter, the crock with a sauerkraut on, they was uh, put a board in and, and they put a stone on the board. And that let, let the sauerkraut work, the cabbage work. So it got sour. And we had sauerkraut all winter. And it was in the basement and uh, there was nothing better at night for supper than real cold sauerkraut. It was like uh, uh, cabbage slaw. Mm -hmm. 
and we had it sometimes like that. I didn't like it was when it was cooked, and I never ate sauerkraut till after long after I was married if it was cooked. Didn't like it. But I had a friend that taught me how to cook it, so I liked it. Ah. Did you, uh, did your mother keep these things in a fruit cellar to keep them cold? We had a very good cellar in the, at the farm, and it was cold all winter, and uh, they was down there. Now, this crock, crock here might have been used to keep pickles in, for instance, mm -hmm. or uh, various things. There was a lot of crocks, but these is, this is the only large one that I have left. Uh, there was no use of me, uh, no use of her keeping those big crocks after we left the farm because we didn't have anything to do with them. It must have looked very different in Canton at that time that you were living at the farm. What were the roads and the streams like then, as opposed well, to Well, the now? creek was down there, back of our house, and. and uh, uh, when we were little, we weren't allowed to go down to the creek for fear something might happen to us. And uh, then when we got older, Dad built a raft, and we could sail down quite a ways with it. But Mother didn't approve of it, but he made the raft, and we uh, uh, sailed down there. We had, I don't know what we used for oars, but something anyway. But he had used old fence posts and things like that to make the raft with. And uh, farther west on the creek, there was a big swimming hole, and that was out of bounds without, you were old enough to take care of yourself, and I never went there. My dad caught, taught me to play cribbage, and I still love to play cribbage to this day. Uh, there is no game like cribbage, it's a two-handed game. But before that, we played dominoes, and we played flinch, and we played checkers. Only I could never win at checkers. I was never a checker player. And Did you get into any mischief when you were a child? Oh, yeah, plenty, probably. <laughs> any stories you'd like to, to tell us about the kinds of uh, well mischief kids got into then? Uh, My folks took in kind of an orphan, and we were going to school, and they had a picnic at school that day, and, and I carried the basket to school, and I wanted him to carry it home, and he wouldn't. And so I took out his knife, fork, and spoon, and, and plate, and set them beside the road. And uh, I went home, and I told Rick that what I did, and Dad just said, We'll turn around and go back and get them. And you didn't disobey. As you got um, uh, older and um, the depression came along, what? How did you experience the depression? Was it a very difficult thing for you? I, my mother had money in the Wayne Bank, and the the banks closed, and. I had been teaching school for just one year, and I had spent all the money that I earned uh, and bought all the things that I was thought I was deprived of before that. And so the, the day, last day of school, the banks closed in Wayne, and it was a pretty rough summer, I tell you. Uh, we went over to my aunt and uncle's and helped out over there. And we got our vegetables and whatever they had over there, they shared with us. And then, when I started school the next year, I knew that I had to be careful with my money. What kinds of gifts did you exchange during Christmas? Just little gifts, probably less than a dollar. Of course, you could get quite a good-sized gift for a dollar. But when I was little, uh, of course, we hung up our stockings, and there was always an orange in the stockings. And uh, when I was little, there was like a doll buggy and a doll and a coaster wagon for my brother and uh, candy canes and things like that. And 
I don't know why, but we never had Jello but Christmas time. What kinds of decorations did you have on the tree? Did you make them yourselves, or did you I think buy they them? were pretty much made ourselves. I don't remember having any special de decorations for the Christmas tree. I, I know we had a Christmas tree. Not always, but most of the time we had a Christmas tree. But the main thing was with the kids, the Christmas tree at church was our Christmas tree. And I don't know, I don't remember how that was decorated or anything, nor who decorated it. But I do remember that my dad had a fur coat and a red stocking cap, and many times he was Santa Claus and they didn't even know who he was. <laughs> Did you celebrate Halloween? Did you go out trick-or-treating? No, yeah. no. From where I lived, it, you know, somebody would have had to uh, driven me. No, I didn't go out trick-or-treating at Halloween. But we, there was always, after I got in high school, the young people always had a Halloween party at the church. And we had pumpkin pie and played games and things like that. What responsibilities did you have at home? Your, your parents, I, I assume, gave you chores? Well, I guess that sometimes I didn't have very many responsibilities. I had to help do the dishes occasionally, not always. And my mother was one of these people that um, could do it faster and get it over with rather than be bothered with anybody. Uh, the one that, job that she liked when I got older was dusting and I had to dust three times before I got it done right and it was my fault. But if grandma knew I was having trouble, well, she'd sneak and do a piece or two so it was done right and then and as I got 10, 11 years old I used to pray that my dad would have a job for me on Saturday, so I didn't have to work in the house. Your parents started out with a wagon and horses, is that correct? Well, they had all the farm machinery that they had at that time, rather than just a wagon and horses, because they weren't either one of them very young when they were married, and my father had been working the farm before that. He worked the farm, and so they tell me he had a fencing business, a wire fencing business, and he built fences all around for people. And he had, what do they call it today? They had, he had a franchise, I would say, for building fences. And he did that. And he had all that equipment to build fence with. There's another episode I remember. Uh, I was still going to the country school, and this man was working with him, helping him build fences, and he got his thumb or a finger in the way, and my dad clipped at the end of it off. And he rushed him right to Wayne, to the doctor, and they got it taken care of. But the doctor had to give him anesthetic. In the meantime, my mother's mother got sick, and uh, she went up there, and I went home from school. And Dad said, I, I, was, I went out to get the eggs, because that's what I was supposed to do. And Dad said, take hold of my hand and help me to the house. And I, I was afraid. I didn't know what was the matter with him, why I should take home take hold of his hand. He said, you better go and get your mother. So I went up and got my, walked back to Sheldon, got my mother, and she, she of course, was real worried to know what happened to Dad. And uh, so uh, he laid down, and, and the antiseptic worked off, and he was all right. And uh, But he got too much of the antiseptic. He had to well, this was just a general practitioner with it, of a doctor, and he had no nurse or anything to help him, and he took, had to take the uh, finger or thumb, whichever it was, off to a joint. 
and, and my dad assisted him, and he got a benefit of the antiseptic. Do you remember when they got their first car? Yes. Oh, we didn't have a car, but most everybody in the country had a car. So I well remember that. That was 1923. We got two cars pretty close together. We got a sedan, and, and my niece that was here last night wanted to know what it looked like, and I got the, uh, a book that I have on Ford and showed her. And then he got a Ford Roadster and took the back off and had a, a box built on the back where he could put his milk cans, he could put anything. And that's the car that I really drove the most before he died was that one because my mother didn't approve of me driving. She didn't think I knew enough, I guess. But you drove anyhow. <laughs> You but drove. I drove with Dad. <laughs> yes. I remember you uh, telling me a story about uh, a farmer who was working on your property after your father had passed away. And uh, you had the job of... Oh, well, this was after my father passed away quite a while. And it was during Depression, and they didn't have any money. They couldn't have any rent, uh, pay any rent, and my mother's money was locked up in the bank. and. And she had gone to try to collect rent, and she had gone and tried to collect rent. And I guess they didn't have anything to give her. And finally I said, well, we're going to have to do something about this and get somebody that can pay rent. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to put them off. So uh, I went ahead and put them off. We, we took, I don't know how many chicken, but my mother uh, canned the chicken, so we had chicken later you know, later, and I took everything that I could take that they had raised, and I put them off. We got another farmer on that, and he wasn't much better, but he only, he was only there a year, and then we got a real good farmer, and uh, uh, he was Hungarian, and first he had a lot of dairy cows, and then he raised sweet corn, and uh, we were always welcome to go to the farm, and and uh, when my son got so he could uh, sit on the seat of a tractor and steer it, when they picked the sweet corn, he went up there and uh, drove the tractor and for them to pick the sweet corn. Looking at Canton today, uh, from what you remember, what, what are the things that you notice that have changed the most? Well, to me, we live in the lap of luxury now, most of us. And we, we didn't have, we, we were happy people. We had plenty to eat and good things to wear and everything, but uh, none of my friends went to the movie every week uh, or anything like that. We, we just, I don't know how to explain it, but we just didn't have the wherewith the kids today have. I think I've done everything. Good life. What? Good life. I, I've had a very good life, and I've done, this is something I never dreamed of doing with all these things. And uh, I've, I've done that, and I, I've done everything at school that any school teacher could do. Uh, I got myself in trouble once, bad troubles, but uh, the principal wouldn't cooperate. Um, this kid wanted to go deer hunting. And I said to the kid, shall I sign this slip for Gary to go deer hunting? And they said, well, I don't know. And one kid said, if we get a deer, de uh, deer dinner, that's all right. So I said, well, Gary, it's just like this. If I sign this, you have to give us all a deer dinner. A bad mistake. 
he got a deer. And his mother sent me a note that she'd make deer burgers and coleslaw for these 30 kids. I went down to the principal and asked him if I could use the cafeteria. And he said, no, you don't have a food handler's license. Oh, me. What was I going to do next? So I told the kids. I said, can't do anything about it, but that you're all welcome to come to my house and, and uh, we'll have the deer burgers there. So the woman come with uh, burgers enough for all the kids, at least two, and, and uh, rolls and coleslaw. And the doorbell rang about that time, and Mr. Hawley, who was in the paint business, was at the door, and I thought, what does he want now? <laughs> and he, he had two gallons of ice cream. He said, more, if more parents would do this, he said, kids would be a lot better, and I want to be part of it. His daughter was in the class. The girls had made cake, and he had bought the ice cream. So, so that's the kind of things I got myself into. And it's it's really uh, you learn a lot by sponsoring a high school graduation class. And I've done that two times. The first time it was very delightful. The second time I had no troubles. But I would never do it again. What did you learn? What? What did you learn? Oh, you learned that you had to uh, play with the kids and accept a lot of things that you don't uh, accept in the classroom. Uh, I didn't ever accept any monkey business in the classroom. And you have to expect monkey business when you're sponsoring a class. After I taught and retired, I married Lewis Hargraves, and I, uh, we traveled. There wasn't any place that we missed, I don't think, except Hawaii. I've been in all the states except Hawaii, and I have been all European countries most, and the Caribbean, and uh, Holy Land, and all over. And in the, while I was traveling around, I made a collection of dolls. Um, and I have about 125 dolls dressed in their native costumes. This is the church where my grandmother, uh, Jarrett, was baptized and went to church when she lived in England. This is a picture of the church where my uh, grandfather, Jarrett, went to church, was baptized. I have his baptismal certificate, or at least a copy of it. And this is a picture of the church where my grandfather, Sutlington, went to church in Stonehouse, England. 